Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. My name's Alec McCutcheon. I'm a director of Unicom. We're hosting the webinar today, which is on the theme of managing agile. It's a very topical subject. I mean, from, from our end, we've been involved for many years now in organizing agile conferences, and this is an issue that, that continually comes up and seems to be at the forefront of many organizations thinking is around how do you put governance and management and structure around Agile. We found from our perspective a lot of organizations seem to be doing Agile at team level, or have scrum teams very, very successfully in many cases. And I think this is definitely the way Agile seems to be heading and where things are. So what I'll do now, I will hand over to our presenter who is Ian Graham Dick from Lamry. Graham's got many, many years experience in the IT industry. Um, what's also very interesting about Graham's background, he, he's director of Lamry, which is an organization which is very heavily focused on CMMI. They conduct uh, CMMI consulting, training, and appraisals. So he, he's kind of seen uh, the growth of Agile and, and governance working together. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Graham and just one quick thing to mention, we actually have three conferences taking place this year. Uh, that just in a few weeks' time on the 6th of March, we have two Agile conferences which are running in parallel. One is called Agile in the Public Sector, which is aimed at government organizations, and the second co-located event, which is on Agile methods in the finance sector. So it would be very interesting to, to compare those two business sectors and how they're adopting and working with Agile. And thirdly, we have a very big conference. In one dimension, yes, it does. And the other dimension, well, no, it doesn't, actually. Because um, what we do as a business, we tend to do kind of top-down um, process improvement using models like CMI, et cetera, to help drive organization-wide improvement. We also help organizations from the bottom up um, do process improvement. And nowadays, often, what we get asked is, well, we're trying to implement Agile. We've done it very, very successfully on one or two projects. And now we either want to take it wider and get more people involved with, across the organization and start making it more of a systemic way forward, um, or also we actually want to start tackling some tougher problems of Agile. Um, you know, what happens when I start putting my head over the parapet, so to speak, and I've got to interface with my organization to establish governance structures? You know, what happens when um, my, my business users just aren't as available as I'd really like them to be? You know, what happens when I've got offshore providers who, I'm sorry, but the organization says, you know, we're mandated to kind of work with these guys. And as my project, you know, as I start check, checking off bigger projects and trying to tackle bigger projects of Agile, I've just got to play that game. So we kind of get asked by organizations to kind of help with those sorts of challenges. And to a certain extent, it's those sorts of challenges that have led, you know, really led, led to the um, production of this, this little seminar. Um, so let's move on. Okay. Um, so we'll talk briefly, very, very briefly, agile history, then look at some of the challenges, and then look at some approaches we can um, pull in to um, help address the challenges. Okay. So first of all, without much ado, I mean, agile works, no question about it. Um, it's absolutely got a sweet spot, um, which is content, content for the moment anyway, moderately sized projects. Um, a lot of cl close collaboration with the end user, empowered product owner, um, and key there, you know, time to engage, time to engage with the business and with the team, development team. Um, however, there are some classic kind of agile pitfalls. Um, one of those is kind of ignoring at your peril existing business as usual structures um, in, you know, in the organization. You know, the, the dislocated test team, for example, the existing governance structures which are more focused on waterfall, um, things like that. Um, failing to recognize that actually sometimes we've got to tweak Agile to engage with the context we're in and actually kind of earn the right to work in an Agile manner in our business. Um, and also, you know, increasingly nowadays in larger, larger organizations, there's just strategic delivery channels which have been set up for all sorts of very sensible reasons. Um, often these are offshore partners, 
and you know if we if you know there's only so long we can kind of fail to it if you like engage with with those channels sooner or later we've just got to embrace that and work with those guys again this is a chart I've kind of stole, stolen from um, Scott Ambler and then tweaked ever so slightly um, and the interesting thing is if you look at it it's, it's, it's a whole bunch of kind of of continuums really from you know enterprise discipline to compliance requirements to domain complexity to technical complexity and when you chuck agile methods onto that you kind of and, and map it on and the, the little little um, puce colored boxes are kind of mapping this really the balance of industrial experience of agile so far tends to be to the left side of each of these little continuums um, and to a certain extent what this presentation is about is about well what happens when I start tickling over to the right-hand side of those continuums. What happens when I start introducing some geographical distribution, some you know, additional requirements for enterprise discipline, if you like, um, when my organization isn't quite as flexible as I'd like it to be, um, a more complicated domain of like bigger teams. You know, what happens then? How do we, how do we adapt and you know, take the fantastic benefits that Agile brings and you know, still get those benefits and exploit them, but in these slightly more challenging environments okay the interesting thing about agile now is is there's a couple of interesting points the first point here is that you know we're all familiar with the uh, this this 2001 agile manifesto you know the kind of the root of it the thing that kind of to certain extent kind of it was the flag being pulled up the flagpole really and, and got us all starting to sit up and pay attention and and rallying under this banner which was agile um, you know since then uh, you know I think it's fair to say it's been getting serious, tra you know, it's really been starting to get serious traction now. Um, many, many organizations, all the big dot coms, clearly they all deliver with Agile and very successfully. Um, the interesting thing, you know, that we see is that increasingly large corporates um, are also starting to, if not get into Agile, they're absolutely Agile is on the agenda and they're starting to worry about it and say, well, should we actually be adopting and if so, if so, how? Um, the UK government has increasingly Im embraced, you know, interestingly, after the 2011 System Error report, um, saying, you know, one of the one of the solution or part of the solution set, should we say, to delivering more effective IT in government is to adopt Agile. You know, it's not that it's not the panacea, it's not the not the, the holy grail of this, but it's part of a, part of that solution set. Um, and since then, the whole Gov.UK thing has, has kicked off, and increasingly. Um, government, big government departments are being encouraged to to use agile in in their in their in their developments as they kind of go digital, should we say, and, and start to digitally enable um, government IT. So, real traction starting to happen there. The interesting thing that a lot of folks forget is that 2001, you know, the, the, the manifesto wasn't the start of agile. It actually goes way back. The principles behind that go way back to even the 1960s. Um, the Pro Project Mercury, the thing that put the first, you know, the first American astronaut into space in that tiny little silver capsule, um, actually used incremental and iterative development to build the mission software for that. Um, space shuttle avionics systems back in the well, it probably was the 1970s when that stuff was developed, used incremental and iterative development. Use cases have been around since 1986. The first, perhaps arguably one of the first agile methods. Um, what was became the rational unified process um, that actually was kicked off in back in the 90s, the very early 1990s, Scrum early 1990s as well, DSGM mid 1990s. So actually, there's there's actually quite a heritage of tools and techniques behind Agile. Okay, a quick recap in terms of you know why does Agile why does Agile work and what is it for those out there um, who perhaps aren't, aren't quite so familiar. Um, the, the best real description, I think the best description of Agile is, 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 is this kind of variant of this classic picture. It is taken from Scrum. Scrum is, is, is kind of become, has become almost a de facto epitome of you know, what is Agile. The idea is, is that you, is we, we, is we break down our, if you like, our requirements set into what's called into a product backlog, essentially a set of features, and we draw those from our users, our customers, the team, and from other stakeholders. We then don't just, in the classic approach, we don't just sit there and then blast our way through those in one huge, long, great, hideous development cycle and finally gasp at the end and release something. The idea is we basically break that product backlog down into small, manageable chunks and deliver those over one or two week 
windows, and each of those one or two week windows we call a sprint. Um, and in the sprint, we have a small, relatively small development team, seven or seven, sort of seven plus or minus two developers, ideally with cross-functional skills. And that team is empowered to effectively grab a subset of those product backlog features, collaborate very closely with the product owner and with the business owners of those, require, those requirements, mm -hmm. move as fast as possible and integrate that code and test it, and at the end of that two and demonstrate. So we've actually got a product increment is the idea. immensely difficult to articulate what it is that the end, end system must actually do. Um, and it's often, the irony is, it's often only when they see what purports to be the, the final system that they actually have the epiphany moment and go, well, yes, it's kind of like that, but not quite. Um, and this addresses that head on by giving, by building a slice, if you like, a slice of that end system, getting it in front of the customer so that you can see as early as uh, and, and, and target, you know, get the vector, if you like, which is the development vector pointing in the, you know, more, the more correct direction. The idea is then we evolve these features over time. Um, and the whole project is about delivering good enough, you know, good enough quality and and actually the features that are really, really required um, over time. Okay, so let's move on. Another key thing, is, key thing of the approach is, is every, at the end of every sprint, it's this learning. It's a continual improvement actually happening there inside inside the project. So we get better and better at working the process, our development process. Okay, looking at our sourcing. Um, as we start putting ahead of the parapet and reporting our first successes of Agile, we find that kind of often that more people, in the, more senior people sometimes in the organization and colleagues in different parts of the business start becoming helpfully interested, is probably the best way of putting it in what we're doing and how you deliver. Start asking governance type questions of us, um, forcing us to kind of, forcing us, you know, to, 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 to back up and, and, and support what we're doing. Um, you know, not enough words, not taking it for granted of what we're doing. Also, what happens is that unfortunately, we start not being able to cherry pick the people we want anymore. We can't work with just a, the small group of people who are kind of almost like have self elected and charged forward and really worked with the approach and learned how to use it. We've actually got to take take the approach to the rest of the organisation to perhaps the folk who quite not aren't quite as flexible or collaborative as we might need. Um, and also, some of that team that some of those folk will be very very narrowly specialised um, and not able or willing perhaps to expand their skill set, um, you know, all of which are things that kind of start to make it a bit more challenging to uh, work with the approach. And also, we're, we're less able to cherry pick our projects, you know, we're going to get the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, and also, we're going to get projects of, of significant scale work then. It's, it's first of all, it's don't fight that, you've just got to accept it and go with it. Um, and the trick to going with that is we're going to have to compromise. Um, but above all, we've got to compromise, but we've got to try and maximize, keep maximizing agile trends. Um, part of that, so absolutely preserving an empowered, an empowered team, um, embracing change and feedback. You know the most, you know the the most powerful, powerful um, vehicles there. Because you know, if we, if we start locking out change and feedback, what happens is it doesn't go away. It just snowplows and snowplows, and inevitably there's a huge course correction way down the line when it's very, very expensive to implement that course correction. So we embrace change and feedback such that we're, we're, we, we, as a vehicle for understanding we're closer, actually perhaps better on course than we would otherwise be. And make, you know, absolutely exploit customer contact. And above all, continuous integration. Fight all you can to keep continuous integration and to um, ensure that your sprint content is repeatedly tested. And what that's really getting at is just doing the hard stuff early. The hard stuff which in, always comes and trips us up if we don't. Um, get that done and get that done early and then repeat and repeat and repeat. And one of the immense powers then of driving through, keeping continuous integration going and keeping testing of each increment, testing each end of each sprint, test, 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 is that what you do is as we incrementally build our system, what we're doing is we find that the, the increments we built earlier, we're actually regression testing them. And actually, they, by the time we finally finished the project, elements of our system will have been tested dozens and dozens of times. And we actually come out at the end of a, an agile project, you actually come out with software, which is perhaps the best soft tested software the business has ever had. 
Um, and that's that's the, one of the huge benefits of the approach. Okay, let's set the scene. A typical kind of business context. You know, leadership team come up with an you know an idea for um, a business change or a product, something that's going to enable the business. Now, often that is underpinned by IT, and often there's a number of effectively IT IT changes required to deliver that deliver that business change. And typically, they'd all they'd be kicked off, commission kicked off, deliver, transition to life, operate, and it's only when they all get to get to operate that we actually um, and you know that business change is actually enabled and benefits delivery can actually start. And so the, the key here is kind of starting to understand that context and understanding that the leadership team have expectations down on, on individual deliveries um, and they're not necessarily the same expectations that the delivery team might kind of appreciate. Um, drilling in this a little bit further, um, there's often established governance in, pro, in, in, you know, in place, and it's there for really, really good reasons. You know, at the end of the day, the leadership team need to understand that, um, you know, have, have a reasonable um, say or no say in terms of, you know, reasonable confidence that the, the, the solution is actually going to be delivered. Actually, a reasonable confidence understanding when the solution is going to be delivered because of solution delivery, which is benefits delivery, which is business advantage, which is, you know, effectively something we can sell better or more effectively. Um, it's meeting a business need. Um, so there's a reason for governance It's there. And also, there's often an investment case behind this stuff, clearly, and in it's understanding that, 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 that the investment is being, you know, is being made wisely and is uh, governed appropriately. Interestingly enough, when you look at statistics which have been done, taken, there's a, there's a, and, and surveys have been made in terms of barriers to agile adoption, and I've, taken, I've stolen a few figures here on the right-hand side of the slide, um, from an organization called Version 1 in America, and they run an annual kind of state of agile development survey. And, you know, just go Google it. The link's at the bottom there of the slide. Go Google it and have a look at it. It's very, very interesting. Um, and these are sort of challenges, the top challenges here. Um, you know, the agile adoption fails. One, you know, you can't change the organizational culture. Um, resistance to the organization to change, and then, you know, trying to fit Agile into a non-Agile framework. So, you know, there's three reasons there which actually all come down to the same thing. This kind of culture clash, this impedance mismatch between what Agile is actually asking for um, and what the business is kind of prepared to, prepared to give, really. So we've got to kind of adapt to that if we want to survive and exploit Agile. So what do we do? I mean, you've got to be pragmatic about this, and what we urge is you've just got to fit in at first. Um, so we've got to compromise. That means, you know, until you've until we've earned the right to be heard, we've got to play by the rules. Because um, otherwise, you know, people just will not listen to us. And what people do listen to and respond to is success um, and demonstrable success. So to get that success, because we we all know agile agile works, agile delivers. But to get that success, we've got to just play by the rules initially, and you know, play the game, should we say? Um, so we have to flex agile. Um, such that in future we can then start suggesting to the organization how the organization itself adapts to better fit it to work with Agile. Okay, some kind of challenges now. Often, you know, one of the challenges, you know, it's a big assumption, we assume that the product owner, a product owner maintains a link to the business case. In other words, has a really clear, clear understanding of what features in the, you know, what features in the product backlog are intrinsic to delivering the benefits described in the business case. And the interesting thing here is, is what we have there is when we're deliver is, is, is in order to deliver the business case that the functionality dimensions that there must be these key features delivered. But also there's a kind of often a time and dependency dimension. Um, sometimes in between you know between components, even between projects, um, and also between the business and um, with you know the needs of needs the needs, the operational needs if you like of, of the solution. Um, and this interesting kind of dependency mesh, the interesting thing is that no Agile method directly addresses this as a potential issue. Um, so it's something that is just, it's, 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 there's no, not necessarily magic bullets for this, but it's absolutely worth being aware that, you know, just because immediate business owners believe, have, have a, will have a view on priority that of, a, of, of um, features, that's not necessarily the same view as um, business business leadership have, and it's worth understanding that there could well be a tension in there that we need to take account of. 
Okay, so we drop down a level. Let's look at we're building our project, our product rather. Typically, we build a product, we transition its life, we operate. Well, hey, wonderful. We've got our agile approach here. How are we going to build a project? The product answer with a number of, over a number of sprints, and we're going to iterative, iteratively and incrementally build our solution over those sprints. At the end of each sprint, we're going to deliver. We're going to drive. Um, we're going to demonstrate to the customer. We're going to get feedback. We're going to make in-flight corrections to our um, our vector of direction, if, if you like, um, as we as we as we facilitate the cost, our customer better understanding what it is they're actually trying to deliver and what they what they're actually getting. But what happens when we introduce solution complexity and scale to this? Um, you know, we often find we don't have enough product owners to go around. Um, what happens if we've got more than one product owner? That's potentially more than what more than one guardian of the vision. Um, so that gets interesting because what happens if these guys start to diverge from that vision? So that's something we've got to worry about. And then we've got a product backlog. How do we allocate that across numbers of teams? Do we add it? Do we allocate it um, just first come, first served? Um, how else do we, you know? Do we allocate it by by architectural component, by solution component? It, it's it's not necessarily obvious, and there's pros and cons of of, of either approach there. Um, as we get more teams involved, you know, you recall one of the key things we want to maintain is we want to be able to integrate our system continually. Every single sprint, we want to be able to come up and have a build, get everything back into configuration management, build the thing, and then test the thing. Um, so each increment, each sprint, we'll be able to do that. But again, it gets a bit more complicated. The more teams we've got, it's like, well, the team will integrate what it's just done and build that and test it. But what about how to, who does the integration between the teams, and how does that happen inside the kind of inside the sprint itself? Again, a little bit harder to think about. Um, what happens when you introduce a third party? That gets more interesting. And what about opportunity? Because else, you know, with a third party, we've got potentially commercial a commercial boundary in the way, and perhaps not as easy to collaborate with those guys. And then what about reuse? You know, good old reuse. What about what happens when you've got individual teams? If we just allocate features to teams, teams will stumble across similar mechanistic problems, and the trouble is, unless we're really careful, they'll solve them in multiple ways. So we'll actually do an awful lot more work than we need to do. We won't exploit architectural reuse or you know reuse of common uh, common mechanistic patterns, as it were, um, parts of the solution. Um, you know, and that's a that's a big challenge. So how do we you know minimise that? You know, and then bang, that's what happens when we geographically distribute that team. You know, and I'm afraid you know that just happens. It's you know it, it is already real life. One of my one of my current customers is a global multinational. Um, they're in the um, solutions and communications business, delivering delivering solutions communications to all the global airlines, um, and they have a global delivery team, and they're using you know they're using agile, and they're coming across every single one. You know, they have come across every single one of these problems, um, and they've got their you know their variants of solutions to them. Scale is interesting. Yes. The trouble is, it's, it's just you know again, it's going to happen, and it does happen. Um, that customer I was talking about, you know, they've they've run right into scale, um, and the problem with scale is, you know, engaged end users starts becoming a problem. Um, this particular customer, big big rewrite of a massive legacy legacy system using Agile to deliver it. Sixty parallel Scrum teams. That's what they had going, distributed across the globe. Um, how on earth do you get? users, engaged end users who are competent to talk about the vision of the system available and shared across 60 scrum teams. It's not obvious. Um, and then also you've got the, the classic, you know, mo you know, a lot of users don't want to do lots of travel. Um, they don't want to suddenly disappear off to India for six months to support you know, a dozen teams over there. So it's, again, it's not easy. Um, how do I do full in systems integration within, within the script sprint? Difficult. The management of the thing just becomes tougher. I keeping everyone going in the same direction, you know, building an evolutionary architecture becomes harder and harder um, because te you know teams, you know, how do I actually get teams building consistent common solutions to the you know the common architectural challenges that that will that will happen? Um, all the enabling layers and the, ena the enabling components, um, you know, I actually need to premeditate this stuff and think forward, you know, think ahead as it were. Um, 
and part of that, you know, part of the solution to these problems is, is there's a whole bunch of old ideas out there, well, considered old now and in lots of inverted commas, that have come back from this heritage of iterative and in incremental development back to the back through to the 1960s. Um, you know, one of the classics here is, is, you know, is the architecture word. We're going to treat it as a first-class citizen. As we scale, as we distribute, um, <clears throat> architecture just becomes a first-class citizen. In other words, we have to think with, from an architecture perspective. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes we might need to think we've, we've got to think of establishing across you know cross-functional teams that will provide a delivery life support environment across our multiple agile teams. So in other words, feeding um, features through to um, individual teams, feeding um, <clears throat> an architectural blueprint through to those teams. Um, actually providing governance, actually saying, well, no, you can't make that that particular technical choice because it will have these implications you need to you know you need to use this particular solution type instead so a whole bunch of things like that actually doing the you know doing integration um, another key thing we've come across is, is a definition of done got to get a common definition of done a definition of done and that absolutely means writing it into the contract for your third parties as well and what does definition of done means it means what is you know when do I declare, declare done at the end of a sprint as a developer, when I've just finished coding and checked it in, is that done? Well, maybe, maybe not. What about when I've, when I can build, build that, take that code back out of configuration management and build it successfully? Is that done? Well, what about then if I take it a step further and I can then deploy it onto a test box and run some tests on it? Is that done? Hmm. Sounds a bit more like done to me, and a bit closer to the spirit of agile. But it, you know, it's key to get definition of done, involve, um, you know, engage and source it here, um, and make sure that it's consistent across all your teams. We need to, to, you know, we need to deliver iteratively, and and we've got to build in continuous integration across those teams. Um, <clears throat> and then another key is, is is building and testing end to end as close to doing it continuously as is practically possible. Um, and another big lesson we've kind of learned working with working with complicated customers is, is actually it's sometimes worthwhile when you're thinking of the big picture and planning the thing end to end big picture, actually build in a sp spare sprint which are there just which will be filled up with dealing with technical debt, i.e. stuff we got wrong and we need to fix um, and are just there for contingency. Um, the big project I was alluding to with 60 parallel scrum teams, we were every kind of basically um, every every um, five or six sprints there was basically an empty sprint which was there just to deal with these with these um, these potential issues and we knew they were going to come through you know and they did and we used that time for that <clears throat> mapping to governance. A good clue here is, is, you know, governance is there. It's there for reasons we've discussed. We've just got to go with that. And so, a good, you know, a good answer to that is to synchronize our sprints with the organization's governance boundaries, um, and you exploit the power of sprint reviews to provide, to, you know, to drive up governance information. Um, you know, and, and recognize that, you know, governance is there. It, yes, it feels can feel desperately constraining and desperately kind of last year, if you like, and old-fashioned. However, it's there for a sensible value reason. It's actually talking, you know, about earned value, really. Have I done enough given the spend date? Am I on track to deliver what's needed? They're the questions it's asking. And so we've got to talk to those and actually provide, you know, provide answers. And to be honest, driving through an agile project, you've actually got the best, most coherent answer that the organization has ever had. The trick is, is just to recognize that and exploit the power of what you've got. Um, you might have to do a little bit of work, a little bit of extra work in terms of adapting the information you're already gathering into a language and perhaps into deliverables that the organization can get at its current stage of um, maturity, shall we say. Um, you know, but to a certain extent, that's just the cost you've got to build into your project. It's just life. Um, you, know, you can't fight that. You haven't earned the right to, to fight that yet. Benefits and dependencies. We talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, but one of the interesting things is, you know, is, is you just need to plan this in. Um, there will be dependencies between features and between the order we deliver 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 work, um, and we will and we will just have to overlay that onto onto our sprints. So 
some features will have a, you know, must be delivered by this kind of sprint um, deadline on them. And the reason will be because some other team absolutely needs, needs that functionality to en enable it to deliver key business functionality. Or alternatively, it's key business functionality that the business requires to get visibility of at that particular point. And so to give the business confidence, we just got to actually take that, put it in a plan, and say when we'll deliver this stuff. Um, and make it visible. Saying, "Well, we'll get to it when we get to it," isn't really satisfactory. And you know, it's going to change as we learn more. But at least you know, you put it on a plan, and then we deal with you know, we're going to have to we deal with the fallout if and when it changes. Key thing here is listen. Is as we build that sort of plan and that framework, it's actually you know, you've got to cl keep collaborating and keep listening. And if our teams say, "Whoa, we can't do that," you've got to work with them, understand why, and adjust that delivery. Potentially, you know, get into that negotiation, adjust that delivery schedule um, if we have to. But a, a, a useful point from that as well is, you know, it gives us early warning of delivery issues. Again, if we're failing, if we fail to meet some of these these deadlines, it's just helpful. You know, why? What's gone wrong? What happened? Um, you know, is our velocity not quite as great as it was? Well, okay, we'll have to adapt. Have to adapt the plan then to that. Something we found really, really helpful again is, is, is stealing from earlier work. Is, is think in terms of giving focus to the intent of our sprints, um, and we've helped, found it helpful to kind of think in terms of four overall phases: a what are we building phase, a kind of can we build it phase, and then a go build it phase, and then a business as usual, you know, move to business as usual phase. And this isn't going waterfall on this. What this is doing is we're still running sprints in these phases, but it's giving a focus to the content of the sprints, almost giving the sprint a, you know, a focus to the job it's going to do. So during the what are we building phase, it's about getting a grip on the scope, about getting a grip and understanding what are the key functional requirements, um, perhaps establishing contracts with third parties, building technical prototypes to start underpinning the delivery we're going to do and understanding that we can actually deliver what we're going to do. Um, during the can we build it phase, this has got an architecture focus, I'm afraid. This is the way we drive this. It's actually, at the end of this phase, we've actually confirmed we've got a solution framework that will scale, that will deliver the, the, you know, the, the scope as we understand it. Um, we haven't delivered the scope yet, but we've got something we can, you know, you can actually do the thought experiment and work various features through that and see how you're going to do it. Um, and we've got an architectural framework such as we can start allocating particular, particular components to teams um, to look after, um, such that we can understand how our teams are going to coordinate and where the dependencies are between teams. And here again, we're going to focus on, you know, on higher risks. We've got risks um, attached to our project. Some of those risks are business risks, some of those are solution-related risks. Um, we can address the higher risks during this phase um, the can we build it phase, um, and we do that by actually building an architectural steel thread, top to bottom slice through our solution architecture, which kind of hits that risk hard on the you know hard on the head. Um, you know, transactions per second risk. Do we know we can do that? You know, are we able to actually persist and, and, and store this and restore the information? Risk. Can we scale it? All sorts of all sorts of challenges come and bite. You know, potentially will bite us. We can address. We can actually address them here. Such when we move it into the kind of build it phase, um, we can absolutely now focus on functionality first. Functionality drives this, um, and we've got a, we're, we're building on solid foundations, and we know that as 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 we as we go sprint by sprint by sprint, you know, effectively our, our delivery becomes more and more assured. And then lastly, our business as usual phase is about transition to business as usual. Um, one of the interesting things is is, is on a slight side sideshow here, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a big DevOps movement kind of that's been really kind of kicking off for the last two or three years, and that's really talking about integration between delivery and operations, and talking, and both parties communicating more effectively together. Um, and to a certain extent, that's what this phase is about. Building in risk. Don't forget risk. Um, so we, what we do is we take our take our risks and we map them onto particular features. Which features, if I implement that feature, will allow me to um, mitigate that technical risk. Um, so understanding that that allows us to, to drive risk and therefore uncertainty out of our program much earlier. 
architecture is absolutely key because it enables us to scale. It allows the solution components um, understand the interface between those teams and trip up points between those teams. Um, it allows us to you know, map functionality across architectural components and basically allows the whole scaling thing to happen. And make sure we make and, and also it makes sure we make we, we actually drive in as much reuse of common solution components as possible. However, with multiple teams, again another dimension is you know there's challenges. We've got to make sure we keep feeding these teams with with features. Don't let blockages build up. Um, actually, or well, anybody do, well, they will do, but understand that as early as possible that they are happening and try and keep it as agile as possible. Um, and to do that, what we've found is that as we start scaling with more than you know more than a handful of more than two or three teams, actually we start needing to um, to build in a little bit of overhead, if you like, I call it program team, which is going to kind of have an understanding of the big picture. It's multi it's multidisciplinary. You've got someone in there who is is has a grip of your arch solution architecture. You've got someone who's got a grip of an overall phase and stage plan. You got you got someone in there who's going to do integration. Who you've got so you've got a couple of good integration people who can take the results, the the, the the product increments that come out of each of the development teams, and integrate them together and deploy them and drive the test end to end test. We have to break rules. So taking that diagram on the previous server, we've got our development teams potentially. As you scale with more than more than a handful of development teams, you start start not having time to do the integration and test of the products across those teams inside the same sprint. Um, you know, it's almost the case of if you if you want to maximise the use of the development team, you don't want them standing still. They actually have to move on to the next set of features, the next sprint, if you like, while you're doing the integration test from the previous the previous sprint. That's clearly got a cost because we find issues. Kind of you know a little bit later than we'd really like to. However, it allows this, it allows the vehicle to kind of move as fast as it possibly as fast as it possibly can. And talking back earlier, we talked about the um, having planning and spare sprints for contingency. We can you know that's where those start coming in, in useful. Again, sometimes we need to actually our program team will also worry about allocating and doing the initial um, kind of sorting um, and filtering of the backlog overall um, product backlog and allocating that onto onto teams um, again so that then you start have finding that needs to happen again in the sprint prior to them being consumed such that the development teams can just churn forward and keep running as effectively as possibly as they can you can even allocate in you know as you scale even further and this we have to do this with this particular customer I was talking about we had to build in a layer in the middle because we had offshore suppliers in there, and each offshore, offshore supplier was contributing half a dozen, a dozen parallel development teams. So we had core, a core team then allocated to each supplier who would focus on that particular supplier, managing teamwork across them, and managing subsystem architecture um, that was being built by that that supplier. And you get this sort of this sort of pattern here, pattern here. What happens when collaboration is lower than you need? Um, Classic thing is, you know, our product owner is there to make sure that we hit the bullseye. But if we just haven't got as much engagement with our product owner, or we can't get as much engagement with the business as we would like. What happens is we might miss the bullseye. In other words, we implement something that wasn't quite what the business wanted, um, and that becomes a real risk as we start scaling, scaling the, um, the you know, the solution. Um, and we just need to recognise that that's the case, and we've got to work with it. You know, and there's, there's tricks and techniques out there to deal with that. Um, we can either, we, you know, do, but you know, we need to try to keep the collaboration as high as we can, um, and then and then and then understand when it's going to be a bit suboptimal, and then we've got to consider supplementing that um, to think about detailing our user stories a bit further. In kind of summary, then trying to summarise all that little lot up, I've got this kind of diagram here, which is kind of talking is, is, is hideously unscientific um, and it's kind of talking about requirements of the the y-axis the vertical and the kind of size of the thing on the x-axis and it's really trying to say that there's a there's a kind of area which is the agile sweet spot um, an area which is really simple where stuff's really simple then stuff an area where agile just comes into its own it's fantastic there's an area where we start stretching agile to still allow us to do it 
um, and that's the big yellow bit and band in the middle. And then there's an area on the top right which are called the fragile zone, which is basically there's, that's where here be dragons. And what emerges is understand for your particular project, your particular context, understand where you are. Um, if you move, if you pushed out the agile sweet spot, understand that and adapt agile because you're in the adaptation side to make so you can still use the benefits of agile. If you're in the fragile zone, for crying out loud, just recognise that and then you've got to start compromising. What can we do to push us back down into the you know into the agile adoption that adaptation zone, as it were? Because if you're in, if you're in the fragile zone, um, things are going to be very very difficult indeed. And the lastly, a very cheeky picture I put up. I, I grabbed this off, off the internet, and I, I did forget where. And it's a picture of a, a big team board. And the beauty of something like this is it's the most amazingly fantastic tool for allowing everyone to see what's going on really easily. Um, absolutely awesome. Because, however, it has its challenges as we scale. Look at the stuff on the floor that's potential. Is that a key feature that's just dropped off the wall? You know, you, just, you don't know that. And sometimes we've got to look at this and go, hmm, I need a bit of tooling to support what we're doing here. Questions? So if anyone has any questions, please uh, just fire away. And I think the way to do that is you can type a, type a question into um, onto your screen, and then they come up, and I have one here. And I'll try and explain it so I can see. It's, yeah, good question here, talking about data and database design. Um, and how's that work with Agile? And that's an awesome question. And I think the answer is, is I talked a lot, quite a bit about architecture first, thinking about the big picture. And I think that applies, you know, that applies to data and database design as well. Um, you know, part, you know, the, the database and the data engineering is part of is part of the solution. Um, and often trying to say, try kind of take this approach where what we need, you know, you need initially is a kind of a, a mile wide, inch deep view of what it is we're going to build, of the solution we're going to build. Um, and that allows us to come up with a, you know, to effectively come up with a starter for 10 architectural view and also, you know, data management view. Um, and then and then we choose, choose an, you know, initial features based on risk that allow us to actually test, you know, effectively test that assumption. Um, and and I, would, I, would, I think that applies there to that, to that question, but a very good question. Um, what about distributed agile? Yeah, great question. Um, to a certain extent, that's the the hideous convoluted adaption stuff I had in the last few slides, where we've got the offset offset sprints. That was that was an answer to to distributed agile. Um, there's there's two types of distribution of agile um, that I've come across. Um, there's the multiple teams running in parallel within a if you like a sprint timeline, um, which is what that diagram was trying to talk about. Um, Another organisation I worked with with um, a while ago. It's actually one of the, one of the systems integrators, actually, um, and they, they scale up and they do they they they, um, they actually distribute the agile team. So they have they they, they work with a front office and a, and a back office um, in their Indian development centre, and they have a their sprint um, encompasses a number of people in the front office collaborating with a number of guys in the back office and they run it as one virtual team, um, but a dis geographically distributed team. And again, they will have they have to compromise in that because, you know, there, there's different time zones involved there. But again, it that, that works and they've kind of showed that can can work, but you just got to compromise what you've got there. Is there a danger that you move too far away from Agile and can lose its benefits when you adapt? You're absolutely right and it's a horribly tricky balance. Um, you can you can do, you could quite easily see how that little lot that I was picturing can just degenerate straight in you know collapse back into waterfall and where's the benefit gone? It's, you're right, it, it's completely gone. Um, the, you know the trick of anything is just to hang on to the agile principles because that's where the value is and try and hold on to those for as long as you can. And but just recognise that you just yeah you know, we just got to you know we've got to adapt them at times and compromise on those principles, but try and try and maintain the essence of it. Um, and also, it's just it's kind of under, you know understand when I'm compromising it, and, and just start asking the question. Um, question here into about of terms of techniques for use for prioritisation, um, and to a certain extent, um, 
That's a good question. Um, again, stealing out, you know, stealing out of the out of the DSDM world. There's the Moscow Moscow principles: must have, should have, could have, etc. Really effective um, tool to bring in bring in there. Um, having someone on the team who understands what the business case is is really effective, and recognizing that the guys who are talking to you on the ground, your empowered users, don't necessarily have that same big picture view about what the business is trying to achieve. And sometimes, therefore, prioritization involves a blend of mixing what might seem like conflicting conflicting prior priorities. You know, from the big picture business point of view, feature A is, is very important and needs to be done by a particular time. From the point of view of an individual user who's one of the guys who's going to be using the system at the coalface, you know, feature C is very important. And that's a job for the product manager to actually, you know, you just, we've got to square that circle and try and reconcile that, or at least recognize we've got the conflict if we have it. Um, what else have we got here? Question here about epics and themes and stories for current and next sprint, but our customer wants to know what percentage of the overall project we've actually completed. Very good question, um, and to a certain extent, this is where this is where we start crunching into that kind of compromise area. You know, if we're in this sort of space, and the trouble is, it's a not unreasonable um, question to ask, um, but also it kind of conflicts with um, you know the principle of agile, really, which is to a certain extent we explore and ex you know explore and discover, if you like our features as we're engaging with our end users. So the two kind of almost contradict a bit there. And it's a very good question. Um, I think one of the one of the, you know, to be blunt again, it's about compromise. Um, one of the solutions we've come across for helping address this is, is kind of recognize when you're in that when you're in that sort of context. And then thinking in terms of organizing my development time if you like in phases I found is quite helpful. Because then I can then focus early on in 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 if you like driving this kind of mile wide inch deep view of of our um, of our features um, of what we actually need to need to deliver don't do, don't explore them don't expand them all out but just kind of highlight them all you can do a little bit of work in terms of leveling them um, sometimes I've found that using using moving from user stories into use cases and identifying what is the main flow and what are the alternative flows Doing some doing some thought experiments from a various various user community um, um, experts and walking a use case model through or a user story model through um, in terms of getting a reasonable understanding that have I captured the main cases of use of the intended system and again you know it's not it's not precise it's not accurate yet but it's it's a bit more of an accurate answer and I can then use that as a basis for answering well how how you know how much how far to done am I effectively? Um, it's not perfect, and it will change as we as, as we as we drive for each sprint and iteration. We're delivering um, you know solution elements. We'll potentially move and adjust that, um, but it's just you know it's a compromise, and it's the best you can do at that point. Question here about. Agile is a business-driven approach to give the business what they want. So if you can't get the commitment to the business, shouldn't other approaches be used? Otherwise, aren't we at risk of making the agile process looking like it's failed when actually it's not the process but the lack of commitment? Which is again, it, it, excellent point, and you, you, you're right. Um, it should be a business-driven approach to give the business what they want. The trouble is, you know, you're absolutely right. But in in a lot of businesses, and uh, you know, I come across this in a number of my perhaps more corporate customers. Business aren't interested in how we do our bit, do our work. That's part of the challenge here. You know, they don't. You know, to be blunt, give a monkeys. They want to. You know, they they say, I need this solution. You know, I've got very little time to engage with you to deliver it. Although I do recognise it's absolutely key and important to me, but I'm just absolutely snowed off. Um, you know, I was working with a customer ooh, last year. I think um, they were they were doing a big rewrite a rewrite of um, um, their kind of um, contact management system. Um, which their business was absolutely bought into, realized it was you know critical for them, um, had some fantastic business users who were working with the project, but they were absolutely blunt. They said, look, we've been given over to this, but we have such a small amount of time to give to the project. Um, so you know we, we just had to had to adapt with that and, and, and work with the, with that with that horrible constraint. 
Um, and you're right, it's far from perfect, and, and in a way, it's absolutely barking mad. And what it does say is that the business doesn't represent the value that IT delivers. Um, and I think, again, that's, that's absolutely right, and it's just an ongoing challenge in our industry. We're appalling at communicating back up to the business you know, the value of what we do. Um, and the business is appalling at, kind of, to a certain extent, recognizing how awfully dependent they are on software and systems that kind of work and do what they're meant to do. Um, it's a big communications challenge. Um, question here, a CMI question actually, how do you combine your last pitch and a CMI level 5 approach, um, data collection for project and program managers? Um, <clears throat> and you're right, I mean, one of the beauties of Agile is that you've actually got flight time metrics um, which actually are based on something substantive. Rather than in a classic system, it's like, well, how far, you know, being simplistic, how far done are you? I'm done because I'm quarter way through my architecture document or my design, you know, my design model, which is definitely subjective. We can actually talk in terms of real tested code, you know, it's back to the definition of done thing. So I've really got something solid and substantive to base my measures on. And because I'm running multiple sprints with fixed in fixed time boxes, you know, two weeks, four weeks, whatever the time box is, um, I actually can have some fairly substantive measures that mean something in terms of what's my velocity, for example, understanding how fast and how, how much I can deliver in a particular time. Um, I mean, going back to that big customer I was talking about, they actually used function points um, to um, actually size how much needed to be done. And it's all compromising what you might, you know, a lot of folk would think Agile is about. But it kind of worked for them. It allowed them to be a bit more scientific about what they were doing, a bit more prescriptive, and a bit more, you know, have a better in-flight dashboard, as it were, so they could actually monitor and control what they were doing and actually understand as early as possible when they were going off track. Um, which is a bit of what Level Five is getting at. It's using measures there for to forewarn me of problems, such that I can do something, do then do something about them proactively, rather than kind of stumbling into them. And then how can we mitigate not delivering what the business wants if they don't commit? Which I suspect is the follow-on from the, uh, the person who asked the earlier question. So yeah, great question. Um, how can we mitigate not delivering what the business wants if they don't commit? Damn good question. Uh, <laughs> and is it, you know, I'll almost question back, and is this an element of, especially as, you, as, you, as we scale, where you know, the large projects is an element of, they're all going to be, they are always going to be a train wreck, and it's a question of, can we actually, what we can do to minimize the amount, the degree of the train wreck. You know, there's always going to be dramas and problems. Um, and the, I, I, the only solution here is, I mean, yes, we can disappear off into our bunkers and just work waterfall. Um, and so we don't get any grief for two years and then we kind of deliver something and it's wrong. Or we can actually use as, as much as we can of the spirit of Agile and actually strive to deliver in, in shorter increments. So we've actually got something we can put in front of the user community and actually getting something that works in front of the guys, I think is the best way I've come across of actually starting to drive up the business engagement, um, you know, even if, even if we never have to compromise on what we're doing. Okay, is that, I think we're kind of probably running out of time now um, for questions. Um, so I guess, shall I hand back over to Alec here? Um, and he can wrap up. Thanks, Graham, and thanks everybody for joining us. Absolutely superb webinar. I think it's, it's very, very topical at the moment. It was interesting. You mentioned also about about DevOps as well. Uh, I think that uh, this is certainly a subject a lot of people want to know about. It was born out by the sheer number of questions and people attending. Because I'm sorry we had to, to cut it short, but I'm obviously conscious of people's time who. who uh, which we originally scheduled for 45 minutes, so we thought we'd just keep the question going towards the end. So once again, thank you. And if, if uh, you'd like to hear a recording of the webinar to share with your colleagues, we will be making this available. We'll send everybody a link. And once again, if you'd like information about the conferences I mentioned at the beginning, the Agile conferences, and also we have a, a DevOps conference on 27th of February where uh, Graham's colleague Andrew is presenting. The web link is unicom.co.uk, and also for the big Agile Business Conference at the end of the year in October, the link for that is 
agileconference.org. So once again, thanks, Graham, and thanks, everybody, for attending. Goodbye.